Hi everybody, welcome. Thanks for being here. This discussion series is part of 1111, a Creative Collective's Artist in Residence program. 1111, a Creative Collective is a nonprofit organization based out of the San Fernando Valley serving the greater LA area that focuses on providing integrated and accessible arts programming through community events, public art, exhibition, and education. This program is sponsored in part by the Department of Cultural Affairs, Los Angeles. If you'd like any more information about 1111 or the upcoming discussions in this series, please visit 1111acc.org. We've invited contemporary artist Zena Baltaji to join us as our resident artist through December 20th. Zena is taking a deep dive into the concept of surveillance, investigating the blurred line between the observer and the observed. She has produced a very robust discussion series, which culminates on November 22nd, at which point she will enter our physical gallery space to continue working on a series that she began a couple of years ago titled Marketplace. I'd like to introduce Zena further. Zena is a Lebanese American artist and educator, she was born in Stockton, California, and raised between California and Lebanon. She holds a Bachelor's of Art from the California State University of Northridge and an MFA from the University of California, Davis. Zena's work explores and exposes the tensions within identity and social politics. It reveals intimate transformations in relation to lived experiences with physical, emotional, economic, and cultural mobility. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. We're really excited about um, our Artists in Residence project as well as this uh, discussion series. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Zena. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate the time that um, all, all of you are putting into um, showing up to these lectures and the really special artists that sh are, are showing up to speak about their work and carry on with this conversation. I truly believe that, um, that I, I only have my eyes, my experience to look through as a point of minimal departure. However, I need other people's experiences and to talk and within that exchange is when I can figure out myself within that network and um, move be beyond beyond the self and the self experience. I really appreciate everyone, um, yeah, being here. So uh, today is going to be a very special conversation. Um, as a person that has been through the medical system, I think it's important for me to consider the patient experience of being under medical observation and the layers to medical surveillance that affects us in real time. To be subject to the medical system is to constantly submit one's body for observation, examination, and treatment. This was some of my earliest experiences with separating my spirit from my body so my body can carry forward. Early on, my young body was treated as a project. This is a root of why I see my body and my work to be like appendages or mobility devices that I activate. Um, Panteha Abarashi, Ted Meyer, Leche de Vergen will be prompted to discuss how medical observation and treatment affects how they think and make their work. Unfortunately, Panteha can't be here with us today, but we all just understand because it's a pandemic and time is jello and it, it is what it is. But we hope that they're doing well and um, we'll hear back from them soon. Um, we will discuss how health data gathering can lead to positive medical advancements. The information gathered, if used correctly, plays an important role in mitigating risk, especially in the time of a global airborne pandemic like today. Timely dissemination of data to those who make policy and implement intervention programs is critical to the usefulness of surveillance data. Public health surveillance is one instance that can be known to be for the global good but when combined with body politics, it can also enact genocidal, <laughs> terrible genocidal acts on very specific targeted communities. This comes down to ethical responsibility, referring to individual community consent, autonomy with the gathering of information and a major ethical responsibility to the social contract that state power be used to advance, to advance the welfare of its citizens. We will talk about medical insurance and access to medical treatment and med and medicine from Mexico to the United States. 
Leche de Virgen Tremegisto um, is the pseudonym of the Mexican artist, curator, and producer Felipe Osornio. Known for developing an expanded artistic practice that encompasses a wide range of hybrid proposals, combining sexual dissidence, popular culture, witchcraft knowledge, and science with the art of performance, image creation, video, and writing. He, she, they takes his, her, their stage name from the alchemical tradition and also lives with three kidneys due to the transplant surgery that brought him, she, they back to their back to life after 10 years of kidney failure, which is why their latest projects are focused on organ donation, disease, and medicine. Leche de Virgen is a non-binary artist positioned from the logic of generic multiplicities that exceed the human form towards the hollow beyond the plant world, the machines, and the demonic lesion, and responds to the pronouns, he, she, they, like I said, my next guest as well is Ted Meyer. Ted Meyer is a nationally recognized artist, curator, and patient advocate who helps patients, students, and medical professionals see the positive and the worst life can offer. Ted's 20-year project, Scarred for Life, Monoprints of Human Scars, chronicles the trauma and coverage of people who have lived through accidentals, accidents and health crises. Ted seeks to improve patient physician communication and speaks out living speaks about living as an artist with illness. Ted has been featured on NPR and in the New York Times, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, TED Talks, and USA Today. His work has been displayed internationally in museums, hospitals, and galleries. As the current artist in residence at University of Southern California, the Keck School of Medicine, Ted curates exhibitions of artworks by patients whose subject matter coincides with the medical school curriculum. Ted has curated shows by artists challenged by MS, cancer, germ phobias, back pain, and other diseases. In addition, he is a visiting scholar at the National Museum of Health and Medicine and was recently invited to take part in the Aspen seminars at the Aspen Institute. Ted's rare niche mixes of art, medicine, and stories of healing and survival drawing from, draws from his experience as a lifelong patient with Groucher disease, an enzyme deficiency that affects bone, bones and joints. Ted spent much of his childhood in severe pain, and he really grapples with that within his adult work. Um, and I'm really grateful for, for both of you being here. I do want to read a little bit about Panteja, although they're not here, just because I really love their work and you should definitely follow them. Panteja Abareshi is based out of Los Angeles, California and was born with beta zero thalasmia sickle cell, a rare condition that causes near constant pain. Abareshi turned frequent hospital stays into a de facto artist residencies. And to quote Panteja, since they're not here, the nuances of disability and chronic illness are lost on the average able-bodied individual. And the marginalization, erasure, and violence that I have endured from it alone is devastating. In combination with my personal notions of gender, race, and sexual identity, I am fully immersed in otherness. There is so little discussion surrounding this and little to no exploration of these topics in contemporary work. And I aim to push against the lack of representation. In my practice, I am warping concrete physical forms into highly disembodied abstractions. Through my work, I aim to discuss the complexities of living within a body that is highly monitored, constantly examined, and made to feel like a specimen, taking images that are recognizable as human forms and reducing them to gestural forms is a juxtaposition of my own body's objectification and dissection. And that's a quote specific directly from Panteja Abareshi, and we'll include that in the chat box so that you could continue to look at their work after today's discussion. I would like to open it up um, with, uh, with you sharing your work. So, Leche, would you like to go ahead? Um, I should be able to allow you to share screen. I'm going to make you the host right now and um, so that you could do that. And then after I make you host, if you could transfer that, that power to Ted so that he could share his screen too. Great, sure. 
Thank yeah. you. <laughs> no problem. So you're now the host. Great. Um, so yeah, thank you for, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation and for taking my work into account to this uh, series of uh, panel discussions. I'm very grateful to be here um, also because I think it's, uh, the theme is something that um, obviously um, go through my body and to my mind uh, since like, uh, I think more or less um, 10 years ago or so. So it's uh, part of uh, an important part of my, my work um, as an artist, as a performance artist. And also it's a, it's a kind of a, um, there are not so many spaces to talk about this. So I'm very grateful for that opportunity and for the discussion and everything. So thank you, Sina and Toolbox and also uh, 11, 11 to uh, taking uh, into account this kind of uh, uh, theme no, about the uh, medical surveillance. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna um, share uh, my screen and let them um, let you watch some of my work, um, just some pictures. So we can uh, discuss this kind of uh, um, different um, situations of uh, about medical and the body and stuff. Is everything okay with the with the screen? Are you seeing now my Yes, everything everything looks really good. Nice. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, uh, this uh, series of photographs that I uh, decide to take as a as a point to to start um, the uh, all the all my uh, small lecture of today is um, it's about the the this part of the it was a turning point on my life when when the the doctors told me about uh, I need to have a uh, kidney transplant because um, as you uh, say uh, I saw on, on the on, on the presentation I have a uh, this uh, disease that's this, this uh, chronic illness that was uh, uh, affecting me since uh, 10 years ago or something so I have I, it sounds weird but I was uh, really really lucky about that because um, I was detected in a very um, primordial stage of the of this kind of, of disease. So most of the people don't know that they have a kidney uh, problem until they have a kidney failure and they have uh, this kind of uh, heavy and very um, violent uh, kind of uh, uh, experience with the, with the symptoms. In my case, it wasn't like that. So I realized that I was, uh, um, that I was having this uh, situation because uh, just one day I uh, pee, um, my pee was a uh, my piece was uh, in black like uh, solid like Coca Cola or something like that. So that was the first sign of alarm, and after that it became uh, several of different uh, stories about um, my kidney conditions, and uh, so it resulted in, in a chronic illness uh, without a, a cure and um, this kind of. Uh, um, different kind of experience with the illness because um, most of the time illness is, uh, is a, most of the people think uh, of the illness of something that can happen like for a short period of time and when you are talking about chronic illness or disease it's a it's very different and complex situation so um, the photographs that we are seeing now it's about uh, the moment that that I have to be under this therapy called hemodialysis or dialysis, I guess, uh, I'm not sure if this is the same term on the um, United States, but uh, basically it's, um, it's a machine that uh, takes out all, all of your blood and then cleans it and then put it back on you um, with this um, um, catheter that is in, in your uh, jugular vein so it's actually, it's a, a kind of a, a big catheter. So the, the catheter is very close to the heart. Uh, and um, yeah, this, this is the documentation of that process because I decided to, um, to start to taking this uh, part as a part of my own work. So I decided to make a video performance um, from this. So also I write a text that is called the tree of blood or blood tree. Um, 
that is about um, the, this dialysis and blood situation that was that I was going through. So this is the first stage of uh, of these um, different scenarios uh, with me and um, and uh, the illness. So this is me when I was uh, filming that video performance. That was like my eighth visit to the dialysis. I have also uh, I was very lucky because I was on on dialysis a, a very uh, small period of time. So most of the people uh, have to be there, there from years, you know, like uh, three or more years of even more when you are waiting in the, in, a, uh, in the list for, for a transplant. So yeah, um, since that moment, I started to take more uh, consciousness about uh, all this kind of, uh, if we can say the, the medical uh, history drama about uh, the, the body and uh, how the, that, like the, the medicine and the view from the medicine, like uh, this case of the, the medical gaze from since modernity to until today, how that can be uh, a very important um, thing to, to build this kind of, um, of knowledge about, around the body. So I started to work with this. So I decided then when I was uh, also lucky enough to have a, a kidney transplant, that this is the, the first documentation of uh, post-surgery uh, scars. Um, and that is also, interesting because uh, maybe most of the time you think about the kidney transplant as something that you take and put another uh, kidney in the same area, but actually it's not like that. Uh, they put uh, and the other, the tree, the, the third uh, kidney, they put it on the, uh, this part of the body that is besides um, like in, in this um, uh, part of, uh, of the abdomen. So you have this kind of, uh, um, round um, scar, so they cut that part and they put it inside there. So I have also three kidneys that are not just two. <laughs> so also I I like to think myself as a freak because of that because I have three kidneys and not only two. But uh, but yeah, since that moment I started to to work on performance art again, and I was uh, I passed my recovery and then I started to work with my mom because my mom was. Uh, my mother was uh, the the donor of uh, of the kidney, so this also uh, became a new kind of relationship between us. And also, I I like to think that she uh, gave me to birth a second time, like I was rebirth because of the of that uh, kidney transplant. So also, I decided to do this performance with uh, with her. Well, also I like to to think about this like. Um, I let my mother to enter my world, like in, into the performance art world. That wasn't something that I had done before. I hadn't done it. So uh, it was a very important piece for me, maybe the most important performance um, that I have been doing since I started my career, uh, a very personal and deep level because of obvious uh, reasons. And this performance is called Lifespan or Esperanza de Vida. That is called also uh, in Spanish, like uh, the hope for from life, like uh, hoping to 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 get in that uh, better scenario that is also um, uh, part as a as a kidney transplant patient now. So uh, this performance uh, took place here in Querétaro in the Museum of the City, and um, I was uh, just chatting with my mom as a kind of a talk show format or so about the organ donation, and also this performance has the the ability to um, speak about the organ donation and the uh, culture around donation in a different way that we are used to. So Mexico doesn't have a really um, um, a very important uh, um, like knowledge about uh, the donation and there is a lot of uh, misinformation and a lot of uh, taboo around uh, the, the organ donation. So we have a very small uh, rate of, uh, of donors and we have a, a lot of people like, uh, um, I think there are like, um, until today, they have, um, we have like uh, 23,000 um, people waiting for just in the, in the public um, uh, space for, the, for health, the public health uh, system, they have uh, more or less like 20, 23,000 people waiting uh, 
for a transplant of different kind of organs or tissue. So yeah, this performance was also to uh, celebrate my uh, first anniversary as a uh, organ um, donated patient and transplanted patient. And uh, it was a, it became a very strong bond actually with the audience and also with my mom uh, in a different kind of level. So it was very important to me. And then that led us to uh, keep doing different kind of uh, artworks together. Also this year I made a new video performance with her that is called Injerto, that uh, it's also about uh, the transplants and the idea of um, seeing the transplant not as taking something from your body to give it to someone else, but to understand that someone else is giving all his body to you so you can keep living until you are, even if you are dead, like some kind of a life after death uh, situation that you can still, some part of you can still be alive in the body of a, a stranger, right? But uh, it's kind of, for me, it's um, really to talk about uh, hybridation. I feel like I've, I'm, I'm a hybrid body now that I have a, a new kidney. So yeah, from this has been um, to this moment three years ago since uh, the, the transplant. So most of my work has been uh, doing with this kind of uh, subjects. And uh, for example, this other piece that we are seeing now is called Organolepsia. And also it's a piece, a performance uh, piece that uh, talks about uh, the body and the knowledge about um, the like anatomical knowledge, knowledge about the, the body. And, um, and yeah, so I started to work in a visual and performance art uh, as well, uh, trying to uh, bring this subject to the to a major audience and try to uh, fight to the misunderstanding about the, the organ donation. You know, like uh, there is a lot of uh, things that are are in clear like for most of the people, and that's why also the organ donation keep on a very small rate. So, yeah, this part of a uh, of my work, and also I started to do this kind of performance art uh, when I. Uh, for example, I'm, I'm here, I'm using slime. So maybe you can tell that it's a, smi a slime, but uh, it's actual slime that like looks like a viscera or a internal organ mess, uh, like a, a surgery that wrong, went wrong or something like that. But uh, what I was uh, trying to do is to uh, find also another, another uh, way to understand uh, how is, um, this kind of process works because um, now that I um, a transplanted people and, and now I, um, I understand myself as a, this hybrid body, I also have another kind of regiment of a uh, health um, uh, situation. Now I have to be in taking meds, of, uh, immunosuppression uh, meds for keeping my uh, kidney with me so I can avoid uh, rejection. And so it's something that we have to do if, as a, a transplanted patients. And that also uh, paradoxically um, made me um, more uh, vulnerable to the, I have, I, I have become some, someone that has more vulnerability to the different kind of disease or viruses or bacteria, for example. So for me also this, uh, for me and all the people that have now uh, been transplanted and, and they are taking immunosuppression, also the war, uh, I think that became more scary with COVID, right? So. <laughs> so it's a, another kind of a situation now. Um, so that's why um, I was trying to uh, explore um, this on my own terms in the performance art realm. Uh, so I'm, my background is also for um, uh, visual art. So um, I, I didn't, I hadn't studied the theater or um, something like that. But I, I most, I was more, more, most like. A, image uh, creator uh, before starting to do in performance. So that's why I create this kind of tableau vivant um, images uh, where my body is uh, part of the composition and I take this um, aesthetic from the medical and the hospital spaces and be trying to transform in something else. So yeah, there are some just few examples of that. And also now I'm working on a on this new project that is called Explante, um, that is another kind of uh, 
different um, approach to the same subject. So what we are seeing now is my third kidney, the kidney that keeps me alive and um, that it's letting me to do this today with you and everyone. So this uh, project takes this um, uh, approach from the medical science. So I uh, create these uh, images with the help of tomography and uh, er, other kinds of uh, different um, uh, imagology. I don't know exactly the term in, in English, uh, but in Spanish it's imagenología and uh, resonancia magnética and other kind of uh, uh, different um, uh, um, uh, like tools to see actually how it looks my, my third kidney. And then I worked with that images to create a 3D model and then uh, it became this uh, uh, small uh, thing of, that we can see here that is a kind of, a, it's called transplanter. So it's a planter uh, for, you can put uh, mm, uh, different kind of uh, seeds inside and the plants will grow because it's uh, made of a 3D printed uh, eco, mm, eco biological uh, uh, material. So, and I have these clones of my own um, kidney that now became these transplanters to uh, embrace um, a seed of a, a plant that is called perejil. And um, I think in, in English is um, um, el perejil is uh, uh, persil. Um, yeah, the, so there are these small plants of persil. And, um, and yeah, this, uh, the person has a different kind of uh, properties to, um, to help uh, the renal failure and the kidney failure. So it's a very uh, interesting plant because of that. And this was a kind of a, uh, uh, yeah, a meeting point between the um, knowledge from the science uh, and the knowledge from the, the popular knowledge about the plants that in Mexico is called herbolaria. And I think, and also, in other parts of the, of the world and have the same kind of approach, you know, like uh, different forms to cure the body that is that are um, from the gaze of the, from the medical gaze uh, is maybe looks like uh, something that it doesn't work, but also has a lot of, uh, of um, uh, weight. So that's why I, I put it together. And also uh, there are 23 um, different uh, objects like, like these ones. And they're supposed to be uh, used as uh, props in uh, performance that should be happening, like actually in this month, <laughs> it was that the, the idea, but, uh, but well, COVID uh, changed everything. So now the project is online uh, at explante.org. And um, the idea is to find 23 different people that want to uh, become an organ donors here in Mexico from, uh, uh, for the project and also uh, for the performance in the performance so they can uh, put their data on the um, system of Senatra that is the uh, national center from transplants here in Mexico. Uh, and also uh, the people can, if they, um, they became a donors, they will have uh, one of these pieces with them. So they will, uh, be, they will have the access to one of these uh, this, this uh, experiments that I have been doing with bioart and biomedia, and uh, and also another interesting thing is about the these plants aren't uh, common plants. There are uh, plants that are made from explantes that it's a biotechnological uh, tool that when that you can extract a, a small piece from a plant and then reproduce it on uh, in vitro. Uh, um, situation inside of, a, of the laboratory. So these are 23 different uh, person plants that have been uh, created on laboratory. So they are like uh, inspired on the idea of the maybe someday uh, we can create tissue and organs inside of, lab, of labs and that can, can lead us to uh, try to, to overcome the short, the short age of, uh, of donations, right? So that's mostly the idea that we have uh, uh, around this project of Explante. And yeah, it's uh, maybe that's, um, that's um, the most uh, important and um, new project about uh, uh, this kind of things with, uh, with the uh, transplants and donation that have been working. And I wanted to 
show that uh, show it here, right? So yeah, that's um, that's uh, all that I can say from this new uh, work that I have been doing, and uh, I would be happy to respond to any kind of a question. I hope that it's been uh, most of the things that I'm saying. I hope that it's uh, getting clear. Uh, so I'm trying to to do this translation with the different kind of terms that maybe I, I don't actually use on English uh, so, uh, you know, like uh, all the time. So sorry if I'm most of the time like uh, doing poses, uh, it's that, that's why. So yeah, that's the uh, uh, explant and other uh, projects that I have been doing. And um, um, that's it. I'm very happy to be in, to be in taking part of this and uh, to share all this project with you and all the people tonight, today, sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for sharing, for sharing that. Uh, it's, it's funny because no matter how much as artists we might try to uh, pull away, like we are our work and it's, it's in there. And I just really appreciate sharing all of that because I know sharing our, our work as artists is also sharing ourselves. And thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions and uh, would, lo would love to respond, but let me open it up to Ted so that Ted Meyer could share their work and then uh, we'll, we'll open it to conversation and Q&A. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So You're first- both are strikingly different people, but so beautiful. And I'm, I'm really happy to have both of you. <laughs> well, thank you. That's a pretty hard uh, body of work to follow up on, I have to say, but I will do my best. Um, I'm very impressed by what you're doing down there. So that, that was great. So um, I, uh, I am a lifelong patient. I have a genetic illness. I've been in and out of the hospital since I was a little kid. And um, am I able to share a screen now? No, I need to be able to share the screen. Okay, I'm now the host, so let me... Yeah, sorry, my bad. <laughs> That's okay. All right, so let me... Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm never sure how to slideshow. There we go. All right, so I, I always start with... When I talk to med students or art students, I always start with this because it sort of explains how my health lands up affecting everything I do. And, and I think this is probably true for all patients. So, um, you know, cause everyone thinks your life is a straight line, but this is how my life actually looks. And everything on the right, my art projects, my speaking, getting books published, traveling around the world, doing, learning photography, all that has to do with my medical stuff. And then everything on the left side is sort of the normal working as a designer artist over the years. So, but they all interact. Luckily, they all, they are all a skill set. So this is me as a kid. And it's one of my favorite pictures my dad took because I am with my art supplies in the hospital. And at a very early age, I started doing work about the fact that I was sick. So. Uh, and what happened is a woman came into the hospital room who was a, a volunteer. And I, I think I was having a very bad day. I don't remember the specifics, but she said to me, you can, you can draw about the fact you don't like to be here. And that one comment really changed my life. It gave me the freedom to be able to sort of do angry paintings about being stuck in the hospital. So this is some of the early work. So. Uh, I also, I have only one good kidney. So between us, we have two each if we average it out. So we're, we're good there. But anyway, I have a lot of bone problems. So I did this series of paintings um, in, the, in the 80s before I was about to have my first set of bilateral hip replacements. And at the time I was, I was doing paintings about being sick. I was, I was trapped in the space. That's why they're all sort of compressed, my joints were deteriorating. So I was, I was really just doing these paintings, not so much for other people, but just for me to sort of uh, 
process what was going on with me. And then once the hip were, were replaced, and then soon afterward, there was a new medicine that came out, I started doing paintings that were completely different. They were about love and happiness and the colors were bright. So, so I've been very lucky much, you know, like our other artists here um, to have sort of a bifurcated life where I was very sick for a while. And then because of medical technology, I am much healthier now and have a completely different outlook. Growing up, I always thought, oh, I'm gonna die before I'm 30. And here I am at 62, being an advocate and all. So anyway, so everything changed. My subject matter, my color palette, everything changed as I got older. And then when I, as I became healthier, I decided I had to tell, I still wanted to tell stories about medicine, but I didn't wanna focus on myself anymore. Then I started doing people telling stories of people that had major scars as uh, a way to talk about life-changing events. But much like myself, I wanted to talk to people who had put a life together after a traumatic illness. So, you know, after being told I'd die, all of a sudden they said, well, you could have 30 or 40 more years. And I had to build a life from that point on. And I never really had before. I, I always say my retirement plan was to die. And then all of a sudden I couldn't fall back on that. So anyway, I started doing these scar prints and um, over time they landed up involving more of what's happening to people. Like this woman, if you look in the print, the X is where she had a tumor inside her pelvis and the little calendars, they mark the days off from when she went to uh, her doctor to when her insurance company finally okayed for her to get an MRI. And by that point, the tumor had grown so big that her leg had to be removed to get to the tumor in her pelvis. So I try to use these prints now as a, a narrative to tell stories about people. This is somebody who had um, uh, tongue cancer, oral cancer. So what's happened to me is I've sort of become, from doing work about myself, I've sort of become this trustee of people's stories. Um, and now I'm doing sort of subsets. So this was a series I did for the National Museum of Health and Medicine of veterans. And last year I worked with a Greek photographer and we did a series of people that have had breast cancer. Um, so like, here's an example. So. Uh, we print the scar, we get the story, and then I detail the scar print with things about this woman. So if you look at her breast, her story is that she went to the first tattoo artist and said she wanted Hawaiian flowers, and he just did some colorful flowers, not knowing what was a Hawaiian flower. And when it was done, it really wasn't. So when she had the second one done, she had the right flowers put in. So I try to tell that narrative in everybody's stories. This is a mother-daughter team that both had breast cancer in their left breast. Um, this is somebody who had who only uh, removed one breast yet didn't do any reconstruction. This is a guy who had breast cancer. So that, let me, uh, I'm gonna stop the share now. So that's sort of what I've done and that has led to advocacy because as I told more stories, I was asked to come into medical schools, as I'm sure you have been, to tell your story, to talk about, in your case, you know, the, having to have dialysis, but also becoming an advocate. So I've become a real advocate, luckily, and I get, I work with a lot of medical conventions because I would be asked to come speak at these conventions. And they would always say, well, why don't you go to some of the workshops? And I would spend a day or two going to workshops and realize the patients were never mentioned. It was always, how are we deliverables? And how, how much time can we spend? And how can the doctors talk better with the nurses? But I would go in days and never hear the word patient. So now I work with medical conventions to try to make sure that we are all represented in their, in their uh, presentations. 
So that's, that's my story. Thank you so much, Ted. I think there's so much to unwrap when it comes to archiving uh, uh, the personal experience and then archiving other people's experience. Um, and that it, it, it's well, such a sensitive thing to- Well, I'll uh, say, you know, work, working, at the, working at the Sorry. medical school, um, yeah. for a while I did some work at UCLA and now I have this position with a gallery in the lecture series I run at USC. You know, first and second year students never see patients. They might see an actor pretending to be a patient. They might work on a gummy, um, but they never actually see patients. And what tends to happen, and I don't know how it is down in Mexico, but you know, when they make up a standardized patient, and this sort of gets back to the whole question of the day and information, they tend to make a, a the worst possible patient. They, the person is a minority who doesn't have a job and they're not married and they've got several kids and maybe they have AIDS. And, you know, it's always like this worst case scenario when in fact the reality is a lot of people miss a doctor's appointment because they have two kids and one has to get the ballet or they have to take care of the grandmother. So I think all of us that are advocating as patients, we need to make sure that the doctors from day one, I started medical schools and I don't know where you give your lectures, and, but we need to make sure from day one, they think of us as realistic people with not just major problems and three kidneys, but minor problems like a, a sore back that keeps you from picking your grandmother up for medicine at CVS in time, you know? So it's, it's up to us to keep the medical world honest, I think, as advocates. Yeah, true. Um, I, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, and also I have to say uh, that I really like your work, like um, this kind of uh, prints uh, under SCAR, I think that they uh, reveal something else that is uh, underneath that, that uh, SCARs and they are like very, uh, deeply inside of, uh, of of the people, but also in a major uh, scale. Like it's a, a very interesting way to to bring up uh, this kind of discussions that I think that are urgent to have. Like uh, so, yeah, really. <laughs> well, you're you're the perfect example. I mean, any of us that have a good a good sized scar, mm. you know, I always say we remember the day, we remember <laughs> the doctor who did it, but it's just. You know, anytime you look in the shower, you get out of the shower and you look in the mirror, you're like, that's when my life changed. It's such a marker, you know, exactly. an exact moment when everything changes. I had my scar printed by Ted a couple of years ago. I have a endoprosthetic titanium re replacement tibia, knee and half my femur. And I have to say, uh, that's something that you pointed out too and noticed from other patients is so uh, as a person how rare it is that we get our scars touched by other people mm -hmm. and that's such like a sensual <laughs> and also just like really intimate it's not going to say sense, it's really intimate thing um, printing someone else's scar and um, that within itself, cre it was created a second marker for me, like a another feeling moment uh, of, of claiming that scar. And I think that's that, that one, one, that moment that happens when you print the scar and the person's with you, like that is the most special, that's the art for me of the most special thing, as well as the sharing of the stories and how it encompasses and moves to TED Talks and then your work with USC too. And, pairing patients and researchers and so much work, like all that's important. But that few seconds where you're laying ink on someone else's skin <laughs> on a, that specific part that no one touches but medical professionals. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. It's really special and powerful. It's hugely powerful. I just wanted to, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And, and you know, and I've had, I've had people who, who, like you said, mentioned that no one else has touched their scar. 
and, and the react, I'm, I'm thinking right now, I did a, a workshop and a woman who was a cutter came and she hadn't, she had stopped cutting herself like two years before she hadn't done it for a while. And, you know, we were sort of celebrating that she'd done it and we did a print of her cuts on her arm. And once we took it off, she felt like seeing it, like come off her body and put on the table. She's like, it's gone. It's not part of me. I can see it as a separate thing now. And it's, it's always interesting. And you can talk about your scar because it's, you've made it public and it's so, it's, it's so such a large scar. Some people call me before they even have an operation. Like I want to mark this occasion. And some people come to me years later and some people say they're going to, and they're never going to. And some people want it to be a memory of sort of survival. And then in this girl's case, it was, it was triumph over this adversity that she had beaten. You know, it, it can be so many different things to so many people. Like, what do you think when you see yours? You, you think of your mom, you think of, I mean, that's an amazing story that your mom gave it to you. Yeah, actually, uh, it's like that. Like, um, when I saw it, it's like, uh, something new that uh, became part of me also obviously uh about the, the kidney but but the scar is also that uh, uh triumph also uh, um of overcoming the adversity and 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 this idea of of death that is also a very uh, uh abstract concept but uh, but also there is funny because um i did this uh digital college that, that i i'm i'm I don't know why I didn't put it uh, for the for the presentation, but this uh, is a collage between uh, my scar and my mom's scar. So they uh, get blend together in the medium of the of the image. Uh, so maybe I, I can show it in a, in a few minutes. But uh, but yeah, they they blend together and like in the same uh, path, and they I call that as a bloodline, like you know, for the bloodline. Um, and also as a bloodline, like a scar line uh, for, for the coagulation of the blood after that. So yeah, it, it definitely, I think uh, these scars uh, for me and my mom uh, tied us together even more that like our relationship ha hasn't been any more uh, like as strong as together. So uh, as strong as, as now, I, 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 I sorry, I, I missed the, the words, mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah, uh, it's a it's a very interesting process also between me and her uh, after the the surgery, and I think the scars are very emblematic for that. It's like kind of a uh, the the materialization of a, of that union, you know, like it's an immaterial union, but uh, the scars kind of uh, uh, make it uh, tangible, so you can actually touch it. So yeah, it's a uh, it's very very uh, beautiful at the same time as a strong and uh, maybe difficult right so um talking about scar vis scars and visibility of scars um i think uh, we're getting close to the end of the hour i think i could probably touch i have so many talking points but maybe we could just touch on one is the effect of visible disability and invisible disability and how that could affect actually how you receive medical attention and help, and also how you can be perceived within the public. Maybe we could just touch upon that for a moment. And then that fine line between patient advocacy, sharing, and that very easily, much like um, as a Middle Eastern person, I can be subject to the Orientalist gaze, there is like disability fetishization to an extent where um, we are used as like inspirational stories, inspirational porn in that way as well. So there is like physical ramifications to invisibility as well as visibility. And then how that could, what we're speaking of could easily also be become the latter that is also problematic that we could address as well. Do you have any thoughts about that, Ivan? Yeah. But I do. Do you want to go first, or you want me to go first? Oh, please go go first. <laughs> um, so two things. First, I, I always say the reason I got such good care when I was a kid is I was a cute kid with big dimples in the hospital 
<laughs> and I would have to go to the hospital four or five times a year. And so I would see the same nurses and they sort of watched me grow up. And I'm, I'm totally convinced the fact that I had dimple made them want to give me better care. You had dimple privilege. And on the invisibility uh, note, I'm actually meeting with another artist on Saturday who's starting a scar project and hers is focusing on the difference in the way scars are treated in men and women. That in, in men, they're sort of macho and cool, but in women, they're disfigurement. And, um, you know, like guys never try to hide them, but women try to, whether it's a bathing suit or on the face or, you know. Yeah. So, you know, there, that's a whole other topic to, for the next talk, for your next yeah. residency. Yes, we definitely have to have more. Well, um, for me, is uh, it's a very important uh, thing to to notice, right? Because um, disability is um, is something that uh, has have uh, very deeply uh, rooted into the like cultural uh, standards, like um, questioning what is uh, disability. It's also part of the of the question of, uh, of understanding uh, how make, what kind of things made a body complete or able to do something or not to do something. So I think when we talk about in, invisibility, about uh, this kind of disabilities that there are not in the outside that you can maybe, you can recognize or, or see it, it, it works something similar to the uh, same mechanisms of race and gender, right? Because uh, something that is uh, outside of the body and you can see it at the first sight uh, can determine uh, some kind of uh, different situations, um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, violence, sometimes power, sometimes uh, resilience or other kind of stuff that is going through that uh, realm of, uh, of the visibilization of uh, difference, right? Of the difference of uh, kind of diversity of uh, body diversity, right? So when you have uh, this kind of disabilities, for example, also in the neural realm, like uh, it's not only in the body, but also in the mind that uh, have been um, taught us as a disability, and they are not outside the body, but inside. Um, I think um, there is a, a bittersweet situation because uh, most of the time when I was um, in, the, in the worst scenarios, on the worst part of the, of the illness, of, the, of this uh, uh, chronic illness, uh, people couldn't see it because uh, it's not something like it's like um, in, in in your skin or maybe in the in the worst worst uh, stages uh, you can see someone uh, and and tell that maybe he's sick but uh, most of the time there are different kind of uh, things that are happening inside the body so most of the people won't treat me different unless they know that I was uh, going through something so. When I have uh, the catheter and the catheter was something visible, it was also uh, a, a small change of events that the people started to see it and notice there was something wrong with my body and they started to treat me different. So I think uh, visibilization in, in these um, uh, things about the disability and ability of the body is very important because uh, maybe we have been um, Thought and we have been uh, growing on in, in this kind of a cultural system that told us that uh, if you see something different, uh, you have to treat it different. So um, I don't know, it, uh, I don't have the answer obviously, but uh, it's a very interesting topic because I think, um, I don't know if, if, if we, we should root for uh, normalize this kind of uh, bodies and understand that body diversity uh, is in everyone and everyone has, there are people that uh, just born with maybe sometimes one kidney instead of two and they didn't know it and they are like this kind of also inside freaks, no? Uh, but they, are, they won't be treated as that. And then you have other people that have uh, maybe missing some member or something and they will be treating a lot of uh, different scenarios of that. So, yeah, I don't know what is better, <laughs> but uh, what I'm what I'm sure is uh, that it's obviously a different kind of gaze and uh, with a body that looks different. So 
uh, I'm I'm thinking in that because of medical um, gaze. You know, like most of the time, um, hospitals and nurses and doctors watch uh, patients as a numbers and uh, more than uh, living beings. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, a very like mechanical type of uh, of thought process. So I don't know. If, but yeah, uh, sure, it's a, a, a very interesting thing. I, I don't know, maybe it's, it has to do with, uh, with that kind of, uh, of things, so. Do we have, to, I know we have to end soon. Can I make one more comment or are we? Of course, no, keep going. Okay. So, you know, I was thinking when, years ago I, I worked at Triner's Hospital with the severely burned children. And, you know, that was, it was always jarring every week I did artwork with them to walk in and you'd see the kids who had recently been burned. And so I had sort of a standard thing where I would walk in about five minutes early, I would sit in the corner of the room and I would look at the new kids and just sort of take in what I was seeing. And it, you know, cause sometimes you wanna look because you're not used to seeing how somebody looks if they look differently. But if you can take a second and look at it and just go, okay, that's what I'm looking at. Then when, five minutes later, when I went to work with the kids, it wasn't a matter of working with them and then looking at their face or their arms and seeing what was going on. It just, you know, it's like anything that's a little different. You kind of have to let your brain settle into it. And then once I saw it, I was like, that's the situation. You sort of make your guess on how they got burned and, we looked at the reconstruction that was happening and then I did my art project and it wasn't an issue, but there was always that first minute or two of like, okay, what am I seeing? What's happening here? Okay, I get it. It's fine. It's not an issue. Giving yourself a moment to digest. Um, exactly. And, and then, and, and seeing that, that the human there and so like giving yourself, allowing that moment to happen. I could appreciate yeah. that, yeah. It's more honest, and then you could actually like um, approach genuinely towards the person. Yeah, and it becomes less that. Yeah. Um, well, since it is four o'clock, I want to open it up to see if anyone has any questions. Um, I think I have to I, bring the screen back to you, but I don't know how to do it to give you back control. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, you could switch me back to host no i don't know how oh okay so next to my name under participants you go to more okay. and then you could uh uh find host okay, under that uh host okay thank you so much You could um, also turn turn your videos on or your microphones if you wish to share your face. Um, I would love to see it. I understand not and share questions directly or go ahead and type it into the chat box. Aster, would you would you like to unmute yourself? Um, yeah. Hi. Um, Thank you all for having this discussion. Um, I I personally have been getting a lot out of it. Um, I guess um, what I was wondering is uh, when you all are making artwork about these like very private or I guess not private, but um, these very intimate experiences, um, is there a way, like how do you say like, you know, this is too much or like this is something that I'm comfortable sharing? Like where do you, like how do you navigate that for yourself, I guess? I, I don't particularly have a line on my, I'm very cognizant of other people. Like I don't ask people to print their scars. Usually I wait for them to volunteer, but because I know other people are personal, but I, I don't know how, how your life has been, but growing up in a hospital, you just kind of get used to not having a lot of privacy on these issues. Yeah, that, um, uh, yeah that's true. Um, for me, it's like I understand my my life as my uh, prior uh, mm, 
um, material, like uh, as an, a sculpture should uh, use, uh, I don't know, clay for doing a sculpture. So my life is like my clay. So uh, yeah, I think I have been putting a lot of uh, intimate stuff in my performance, but uh, um, I don't have an issue with that because uh, I think that I believe in empathy as a, as a, as a way to reconstruct uh, social uh, um, uh, structure. So um, even more in Mexico where we have a, a lot of uh, violence and uh, ugly stuff going on like all day, like 24 seven, like, <laughs> so I was, um, since I started, I think doing performance art, I was uh, hoping that making this kind of connection with the audience through performance art or photography or video or writing, uh, sharing me and my life, maybe I can uh, I can find someone uh, that can connect with that and uh, and something alchemical will happen then. So I think that with more of the of the of the past of the time, I have been used to putting myself out there. But uh, but I don't want to lie. I, I, sometimes it has been very difficult to process because uh, not all the people respect uh, your work as you will think they will. They will. So sometimes they have been, well, uh, I don't know why I will bring this now, but uh, <laughs> but sometimes I have been receiving uh, even death threats, like something like saying me like, your best performance will be uh, being dying of uh, the kidney failure or something like that. So yeah, I think that if I haven't put it down on a public record, maybe I wouldn't have that kind of insult or something, no? But I will have another, so people uh, will always be um, haters if they want to, so whatever. I, I still uh, believe in on my work and that's something that can make maybe a difference in this kind of topic, so yeah, it's something that is, um, it's not the great thing, but also it, I think it, help, it helps me. It's kind of a cathartic uh, thing for me. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think personally for me, um, I think it was important for me. I had no choice but to make the work that I needed to do in order to process and mobilize myself through the illness and then post the illness and then process my body, my new body actually post-surgery so I don't know if I have advice because I, I, I had the opposite I, I couldn't share myself I was definitely a person that I just started wearing skirts like maybe I don't know five years ago around the age of 25 I was like I'm gonna sport a mini skirt and share my massive scar <laughs> but um uh I think in the hospital and early on the way that I used art was a way to like work and cope and connect with my environment. So my earliest projects, I could say my first art project was a news anchor video that I did with other kids in the hospital. And there was a little school room, was just a room with the teacher and the nurses. And we would go there and do our studies because I was in eighth grade, so middle school. And um we would make like news videos with each other and it was a lot of fun and it wasn't centered around our illnesses but we would just like we had a sports center section and weather even from inside the hospital it was a lot of fun so i think that the, the ways of coping making art while you're when when i'm in illness i'm i'm just making <laughs> allow yourself to make whatever it is that you need to do to move through it and trust that like it's important and it will come out when you're ready for it to come out because all of that work that I've done while while sick and then post illness during physical therapy and afterwards all of that it was it's a record a time capsule of all of my feelings and everything that happened within that and I may have not been ready to share it at that moment, but it was important to make. And now a few years later, I am ready. So, and I do share it. <laughs> and I still like have a quivering lip and I'm a little like, Bleh. <laughs> but I'm ready to share. I'm ready to talk. I'm ready to connect with others and all of that. So like trust in your heart to continue making the work regardless of whether it gets seen. 
or whether you're ready for it to be seen. Sometimes the work, my own work scares me and I'm not ready for it. So I still have to make it. And then later on, maybe I'll be ready because your art is, you know, the thing, of you, if that makes sense. The thing for all of us though is, I mean, we're still alive. If we weren't, we wouldn't be making art. So that, oh. So our option is be alive and make art or be dead. Exactly. Really. Because we're all going to make art as long as we're alive. So, you know, I'll, I'll take a little loss of anonymity to be able to make art and be alive. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Does anyone else have any further questions? I thank everyone for being in the room and listening to us today. It's been really good. Yeah. Okay. Well, I see a, a video on. Julia says thank you so much. Well, thank you, thank Julia. You. Um. So let's put our little. Oh, do you have a question? Because you unmuted yourself. Oh, sorry. I was just saying thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. <laughs> I thank everyone for tuning in today. Thank you so much for your time. Please tune in for our last discussion in this series um, this Sunday, the 22nd of November from 12 to one uh, Pacific Standard Time. I'll be having a discussion with artist Martin Robinson, Tin Nguyen and Amitis Motivali. We will discuss a whole nother subject matter that has to do with surveillance. And I'm very grateful for all of you being on this journey with me because it's such a plural complex experience that is surveillance. So the only ways to really split it up and honestly an hour isn't enough for each discussion. Um, but yeah, so this next Sunday, we will discuss layers of watching and being watched from government to community surveillance. We're going to address really hard conversations around racial profiling and minority biases. Um, and uh, from there, after the last discussion, uh, I should let you all know, I'm working with Cal California State University Northridge uh, with the students of Samantha Fields in which some students may be creating a call and response artwork in response to the lecture series that we have today and the prompts that we've created. Um, and I wanna do some shout outs to some of our speakers that are you know, doing their thing. So uh, some of our previous speakers, Yasmin Diaz has a show up called Soft Powers at Ochi Projects in Los Angeles. It's still up for a few more days and you could find it through November you could find it online until November 21st. Our wonderful speaker from the first series with Ron Athey, Arshia Fatima Haq, is also doing a performance with musician Maral at Oxy Arts this Friday, November 20th at 7 p.m. It's, to, it's called the Sama, the Divine Listening Room. And then from last, uh, last night, our speaker Gretchen Andrew um, go ahead and follow them on Instagram, follow all my speakers on Instagram because they're awesome and pay attention to their work as they close their residency that's happening right now at the Monterey Art Museum and up until January 3rd and they're going to have a solo show coming up um, in 2021. And I was wondering if Ted and Leche, do you have any plugs, anything to come up that site of the current project that you have? I would love to for you to share it. Well, um, I want to, to say something, maybe it's not uh, something on my agenda. I, I, I just wanted to say uh, again, thank you, Sena and all the people that make this possible. And also that I definitely want you to print my scar someday. <laughs> so I hope uh, uh, Corona will let us uh, happen that uh, and have that moment. And also I, I really appreciate to have this uh, moment to um, talk to you and Sena and everything. So uh, yeah, also, Thank you for all the people for being watching this and i will be having different kind of a, a stuff going through this month but uh, you can all uh, do it, watch it on the on my website or my uh, social media so if uh, you want to stay tuned just uh, look for me in, in instagram and facebook and they, you will find it <laughs> and yeah thank you again for everything <laughs> thank you. and same i just want to thank you for setting this up and 
thank whoever was smart enough to pick you to give you the residency. So that, that, thank uh, you, Aaron. <laughs> do this. It's been great. I have some work up right now, uh, a show on um, difference in, uh, I, it's called Skin Deep. It's, it's talking about sort of racial issues from 10 years ago, and then we've updated the show as an anniversary show. And we've each showed our work from 10 years ago and new work. So that's at Liz's Loft. And, you know, I'm just still doing my, setting up my lectures and doing my stuff whenever I can around COVID like everybody else. That's awesome. Thank you all so, so much. Um, those that participated with us and we're super, super excited to continue this series and then have Zena come into um, the 1111 gallery and be under her own surveillance while creating artwork. Um, if any of our guests would like to follow up with some of our speakers um, for Zena or 1111, go ahead and respond to the email that we sent out with the link. And I'm happy to forward any of those questions or comments along. Um, and unless anybody has anything else to add, I bid you all a wonderful day. And one more thank you to everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your evening and have a good evening, Leche. It is two hours there, so 616? That's a good night. Yeah, it's uh, 616 now, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.